All right. Welcome to uh, Development to Deploy. Uh, this discussion will focus on uh, solving common development issues that can occur when working on teams. I'm Matt Poole. I'm a tactical lead at Bixel. I work on websites for the federal government, and I focus mostly on backend and DevOps. And I'm kind of concerned because I see a lot of people I actually work with in here, so they might call me out on my development procedure. So wait till after the uh, Matt, presentation. Can you speak up a little louder? Oh, sure. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> Helping developers on Teams. That's a gigantic task, and there are so many places you can go with that. However, I'm going to focus on just three small portions of it. The first is how to set up systems to handle the inevitable conflicts from working with a team. I've often found that as the number of developers increase, these issues scale up in their disruptive power. The second is how to get developers quickly onboarded and contributing. The, quick, the more quickly a developer can get <clears throat> up and running, the faster they can help the project. And the final area is how to deploy all that hard fought work to a remote environment. This will be uh, more general of a section. Uh, I know the landscape for hosting and pipelines is extremely varied, but I hope that I can find some commonalities between lots of different projects. All right, who's the audience? Well, technically it's whoever is at this presentation, but I'm looking to help Drupal developers who need to work on a team. The goal will be to provide some tools and workflows that help teams work together and more efficiently. This will not be about one specific development platform like Lando, DDEV, or Dev Desktop. Likewise, it will not be a talk about one issue tracker. Feel free to use Jira, Asana, or the issue tracker that comes with your VCS. And speaking of which, this won't be about whether to use Bitbucket, GitLab, or GitHub. That doesn't mean this talk won't be opinionated. We will focus on developing Drupal applications and prefer tools written in PHP. I find it much more friendly to ask Drupal developers to work in PHP than working with uh, Bash, Python, or Ruby scripts. To get started helping teams manage a code base, we'll talk about issues that can have automated solutions. I always prefer to have as much automation in place that provides feed feedback and guidance. The first problem that I see teams running into are naming standards for Git branches. I see two main goals when validating a branch name. What these goals share in common is that they're all about providing context. If you can tell at a glance information about a branch, then you'll be much better off. The first goal is to enforce the branching model that you choose to work with. For example, if you follow the Git flow standards, you'll want to make sure that you, your users create only branches that follow the feature, release, and hotfix branch naming standards. Please note that this is <clears throat> only a reference to branch naming. This will not save you from your developers pushing directly to the main branch or overriding the history of the developed branch. For that, there are many options for branch protection, which I've linked to at the bottom of the slide. The next goal of branch naming standards are to tie your version control system to your issue tracker. There's a huge variation here in many combinations, but the idea is that there is usually an option you can enable on your issue tracking system that will integrate with your version control system. With this enabled, and with properly named branches, when looking at an issue, you should be able to see what branches or merge requests have been created for it. Your Scrum Master will thank you for providing more insight into how the development process is, <clears throat> is going. This same referencing ability is also available and usually more supported when adding commit messages. We will discuss that after showing an example of a way to enforce branch names. All right. So to facilitate standards enforcement in my projects, I put together a small package on GitHub called Robo Validate Commands. If you're not familiar with Robo, it's a task runner like Gulp, except it's written in PHP and uses Symfony Console. It can do a lot of cool things, like integrate with file system, Docker, VCS, testing, and even Composer. 
I get tired of asking ChatGPT how to create and work with arrays of Bash for the 1,000th time. That's part of the reason why I enjoy Robo. The installation is straightforward and done through Composer. Robo is a lot like Drush, except it doesn't integrate into Drupal. If you just call the Robo binary with no arguments, it will show you the commands that are available. Now that you have the package installed, we can look at the validate branch name command. The name of the branch is an optional argument, and if not given, it will attempt to be detected. In order to configure this package, you'll need to create a robo.yaml in the root of your project directory. The first step is to add your project ID if needed. The project ID is used as a replacement in the various regex patterns and help messages. You don't need to use it, but it can be handy instead of repeating your JIRA or GitLab project ID. This is especially valuable if working on multiple projects. This will become way more apparent when you see how the branch regex is constructed. Now we can optionally configure how the validate branch name command will work. With zero configuration, the image here shows what the default options will be. There's a lot going on here, but we'll go over each option. Note that you don't have to change these options if the defaults work for you. If you do change one option, <coughs> such as pattern, you don't have to change them all. You can just copy a single one, two, or even them all if you want to be super custom. What we're looking at above is a subset of the robo.example.yaml that lives in the root of Robo the Validate Project. So it's easy to find, reference, and copy from. We'll start with the last option, Validate Branch Names. This option should cover all valid branch names that you require. There are four different types of branch validations that are supported. Explicit, this, shows in the, this is shown in the first two options. They are those exact branches with no replacement or patterns matching. In this case, we allow the develop and main branches explicitly. For this option, if you use master instead of main, you can copy these values into your robo.yaml and replace main with master. And if you don't have a develop branch, you can remove it and add the remaining types. All right, and the next option is the custom option. And this is the third item that could be seen in the list there. And this is, the, this is the item that corresponds to custom regular expressions that can be seen in the pattern option that we saw in the last slide. This is the most complicated uh, valid branch type, and it will be explained more thoroughly on the next slide. The next option for a valid branch type is semantic. Uh, semantic type can be seen in the, as the fourth item. This corresponds to a normal semantic version naming convention where major, minor, patch, it, <clears throat> or integer separated by periods. However, the last integer, patch, must be greater than zero. In this case, we use it for the hotfix branch so that we ensure it includes a patch number. Semantic n0 is very similar to the semantic except patch must be zero. In this case, we use it for the release branch where which should always have a zero for the patch number. If you require more configuration and explicit and semantic types don't work for you, you could use the custom type to validate many more branches with more complicated patterns and options. All right, before I move on to an example, I want to zoom in on the custom help option quickly. Uh, the custom help option explains how a custom branch should be formatted. It will be shown as a warning text if an invalid branch name is found. On a side note, there is help for the explicit and semantic branch types, but those are not configurable. You'll note that project ID can be found in the pattern and custom help options. This will be replaced with your project ID option that we set first. The final option is pattern. It is also used only for the custom branch type, and it can be formatted in any way you'd like. The default value assumes that the project ID is in a feature branch. All right. Uh, when I'm working with regex, I love using regexer.com. It explains what each portion of the pattern does, and it allows you to test directly in your browser. In the following examples, we'll validate two feature branches shown here. 
the first branch is invalid and it is shown with a red X and the valid branch is shown with the green check on the bottom. You'll notice up at the top, I copied over the pattern, uh, which is used as the regular expression, and it has a bunch of replacements in it, and everything that's highlighted in different colors can be moused over, and it'll tell you exactly what it does and, and how it works, so you can debug if your uh, regular expression is not working correctly. Now we're finally ready to run the command. Using the default configuration and project ID of DEV, I'll validate the given branch. Here you can see what the output looks like on a, when validating a branch name. In this case, it was invalid because the project ID was ABC and the issue number was not specified next to the uh, issue, num issue name or project name. The script tries all the configured branch types and does not know which one you meant. Therefore, it shows the help message for all branch types. We were trying to match the custom branch type, which was controlled by the pattern option that we saw earlier. In addition, you can see that the custom help option next to custom branch type with the replacement made for project ID. I can highlight that right here. That will be right here. That's where the, the replacement happens. And finally, Here's the expected output if the branch is valid. All right, the next problem to help facilitate is commit message validation. Commit message validation is helpful if you'd like consistent messages or to nudge developers to add ticket or issue numbers to commits. Adding ticket numbers is very handy because it allows each commit to have more context by linking directly to the issue that it was committed for. The robo-validate command package allows for this. Like the branch naming convention, this will allow a regular expression to run on all commits not found on the target branch. The default configuration for commit message validation can be seen here. The first option, target branch. This is the branch that the target branch will merge into. Well, the current branch will merge into, sorry. And usually that'll be developed, especially when you're working locally. It is used to determine which commits are missing from the target branch to limit the number of commits that should be checked. Git remote. This is the name of the Git remote repository, which is most often referred to as origin pattern. This shares a lot in common with the branch naming validation and again contains the project ID as a token. And then finally, we have short help and long help. These are shown if validation does not pass and you can see that they also can include the tokens that can be replaced. All right, now we can finally run the command. <clears throat> and then we'll run this command on a set of commits that have a single poorly formed commit message. And here's the output. You can see the offending commit message is displayed <coughs> below the red box. In this case, that was, quote, a bad message, commit message. The commit was not valid because it was not prefixed with a valid JIRA issue number. Following the invalid commit message, you can see the short help and finally at the end, the long help text. The default long help is nice because it contains links to two helpful articles that can help you in the process of fixing your commits. That is, how to rewrite history and how to push a branch where the history has been rewritten. I found that developers are often leery to make these changes. Now, we'll run the command <clears throat> again after using the magic of presentation images to fix the commit message we saw earlier. This time, there's no error and confirmation of valid commit message is shown. All right, in the previous examples, I've been using a project ID that's based on JIRA project for the patterns. This won't do much good on GitHub projects, where issues are just numbers. Luckily, GitHub allows for similar integration with commit messages. Notice that the regular expression pattern is allowing for a long list of allowed words followed by a number sign and an issue number. If you put those in a GitHub commit, it will link just like it does on Jira and Bitbucket. In addition, the short <coughs> and long help have been updated to describe this change. <clears throat> Since this project itself is hosted on GitHub, I configured differently than the defaults. 
You can see this configuration directly in the project robo.yaml. All right. The next validation up is coding standards. Coding standards can seem like a lot of extra work for not much benefit. Who cares if you use tabs or spaces? Okay, sorry, that's a bad example. Lots of people care about tabs versus spaces. <laughs> Who cares if you place a return between a brace and an else instead of it all being on one line? But as someone who has reviewed many pull requests, it makes life so much easier to tell at a glance what's going on. Readability and familiarity play a big role in getting things done faster. To run coding standards validation, you'll need the PHP code sniffer package and the Drupal and Drupal practice standards from the Drupal Coder project. The easiest way to get all these is by installing either of the packages that you see on the screen. I recommend the core dev package because it has other packages that help custom, develop custom code like uh, I think the hat and unit testing as well. All right, the coding standards check is set up for <clears throat> out-of-the-box compatibility with Drupal. No configuration required. It can find your code in one of two ways, by either looking at your composer.json or using the default hard-coded paths that you see on the right-hand side. This will allow the coding standards command to look for each item installer paths with the custom in its directory. Luckily, this is already set in most Drupal projects. The second option can be seen on the right and will be used if installer pass is not set and uses the most common placement of custom code for Drupal. On the top image, you can see how to set just the paths if you have a very custom setup. The command will, will quietly skip any directories that do not actually exist. <clears throat> and finally, the similar options option can be seen in the bottom image. If set, this will be used for each path configured. There are many configuration options for PHP CS, and links to all these can be found at the top of the screenshot. However, these are a sane set of options i found that work well in many Drupal projects. All right, now the command has been configured, we're ready to run it. Here you can see an example of standards error. It ran for both standards on our custom modules and themes directory. However, there are no custom install profiles, so it did not run for that. In this example, there was a standards error in our custom modules, but not in our custom themes. Coding standards checks will not stop on the first error. It will run on all directories. If there was an error, it saves that and returns it at the end so that your pipelines can fail properly after all coding standards have been checked. And here's an example where all coding standards have passed. I'm looking forward to providing integration to automatically fix coding standards with PHP Code Beautifier, but that will be, have to be for another day. With this command, there's something important to look out for. The validation of commit message usually has a default of the developed branch as the target. When pull requests are for a hotfix, the target will be the hotfix branch instead of develop. This target branch will not be known until a pull request or merge request has been created. Therefore, it's recommended to wait until the pull request has been created to check for valid commits in a pipeline. You can see here an example of configuring a Bitbucket pipeline to run only on uh, pull requests so the validation can happen on the correct commits. And likewise, here's an example of uh, GitHub action. The important thing in both these scenarios is that it runs only on pull requests and not just a normal branch. In addition, the target branch option is passed explicitly using a convenient environment variable in both Bitbucket and GitHub that is available on all pull or merge request pipelines. As a side note, if you remember a few slides back, the target branch was set in robo.yaml. However, those are just the defaults if the option is not passed. Therefore, you can override any option dynamically by passing its corresponding option to the command. Now we move on to the final command, which is more of a niche issue and not super important. If you've <laughs> ever seen this message, you might scratch your head and wonder what went wrong. That's why this final check is provided by the RoboValidate command project. It's the ability to validate the composer.lock file. 
This command will tell you if you will get the previous message when you run Composer install. The reason you get this message can vary, but the root cause is what is when Composer.json changes the hash value of it is stored in Composer.lock. If they mismatch, you'll get this error. And here's what you'll see when this validation fails. The way to fix this is hinted in the message on the screen. <clears throat> that is to update composer.lock with a new co <clears throat> composer.json hash via composer update dash dash lock. And here's the output once the composer.json and composer.lock agree with each other. And finally, here's the default configuration. These two options can be handy if you do not install a composer as a dependency or your composer.json lives in a completely different directory than the root. Now that I've described all four of the commands that are available in Rebel Validate, I'd like to help you integrate them into your workflow. The most vital place to run these commands is before code makes, makes itself makes its way to a feature branch, non-feature branch. To do so, I'd recommend running these in your continuous integration. All four commands can be run independently, so if you want to run them concurrently, that is an option. Another option is to have developers run the checks on their own machines before they submit them for a review. This can be either a manual or automated process. If it's manual, the important part is that they know how and when to run those commands. At the bottom of the slide, I've added a sample pre-commit and pre-push git hook that would automate this process. To this end, another command was added that's, that calls all validation commands. This will run all four validation commands that we discussed earlier. It will not stop after the first error is found but instead wait till all have run and then finally exit. However, if you do not want to use all the commands, this will do you no good. It's very easy to create your own Rebel file with a command based on validate all that calls only the commands you'd like. So for example, if you only wanted to run the coding standards check and the composer lock standards checked, you could create your own robofile.php and add the following code you see <clears throat> and then rename the function to whatever you want. That's what uh, defines uh, what the command will be called when you run it. In this case, it would be <clears throat> my validate dash all. All right, so this is the end of the process, as I mentioned, that can be automated. However, there are a few more that I'd like to talk about that are more manual process. An issue I've ran into many times are fixing conflicts with composer.lock. As the number of developers increases, the chances that two or more people have updated dependencies and created conflicts increases substantially. However, not all conflicts in composer.json are created equal. There are some conflicts that just change the content hash in composer.lock. This points to a change to composer that did not affect the dependencies. This could be something like a new patch being added. These can be easily fixed by regenerating the lock file. This is seen in the second image where composer.lock is reset to the version in the develop branch and then update lock is called. But what about a change in composer.lock where it's not just a conflict in the content hash? For example, there are no changes in composer.json, but there are many changes in the lock file. You wouldn't know if they updated all the dependencies, did they update Drupal core? You'd have no idea. Another scenario, another scenario could be new dependencies in composer.json, but a huge number of changes in composer.lock was that just from adding the new dependencies or updating others as well? To get around this, there are a few paths. You can ensure commit messages that affect composer.json describe exactly which commands run and so they can be replayed later. Another option is to manually update a log file for composer commands that were run and use that to replay them when a conflict happens. There's also packages available that work together with Git to streamline this problem. To dovetail off of fixing composer.lock issues, there is something to be careful of when updating Drupal modules. 
Hmm. Updating them is not as simple as running the composer commands and creating a new pull request. One needs to make sure that any new update hooks that alter configuration have been run and are exported. When adding new modules, it's obvious that new modules must be enabled, configured, and then the configuration exported. But the same sometimes ha is required when updating modules. I found this most often occurs when updating Drupal core. To make this happen, I ensure that I start from a fresh state. This means that I'm working off the latest code and that when configuration is exported, no unexpected configuration is changed. Next, the dependencies can be updated with Composer. And the final steps are to export configuration and create the pull request. My favorite part of starting the development process is determining how multiple people can create content types and sample content so that it can be themed. There are a few ways I've seen this done. You can give instructions on how to create the content and replay them on every single environment going from dev to test to production. This is not ideal because manually creating the content can get very monotonous. It also creates a lot of overhead and work for others. <clears throat> the next option is to export the database and share it with the team. This option gets ugly quickly because it only works once. You can't then take that database and add to it with multiple developers. It's very easy to do, though. Another is to create a dynamic content with a module like deval and the generate command. This is quick and easy, but the content might not have the copy that will be acceptable for review. And finally, you can grab a module like default content that exports your content to configuration. This requires creating some tooling to make exporting the content faster and can, gen can generate bad conflicts as well but it allows for the most control. A small warning with those last two. You don't want to accidentally enable these or use them on production once real content is being created, as you can wipe out lots of stuff. All right, we've talked a lot about how to cut down on issues during development, but not a lot about how to set up your environment. Like I mentioned before, we're not gonna talk about specific local environments, but things that are common to all. The first process is a real time saver, and that's to make sure that there are easy steps to follow and instructions to get someone up and running. This is usually a list of software requirements and a guide on how to start up the local environment and get contributing as soon as possible. After that, a useful thing to put together are a list of common issues developers might run into and quirks of the local environment. It can often be easier to document these quirks than to try to write complex scripts that take everything into account. You can continue to update this documentation as users find oddities and keep adding to it, and this will allow developers to solve uh, their own local issues as they find them. The next tip to help developers work more quickly and not be stuck waiting around is to uh, add a local settings.php where you can disable caching or develop or load development services. This is fine when developing and it saves you a lot of time, but when you want to review your own code or someone else's code, I would temporarily remove these time savers. This will make it so your local environment more closely resembles uh, the production environment. In a similar vein, I would also recommend that your local environment be as similar as possible to your remote environment. This would include using the same minor versions of software that you use on your remote environments. This makes unexpected bugs due to incompatibilities less likely to pop up. And finally, we're ready to discuss deploying your site to remote environments. The first portion we'll talk about is how to handle configuration. An issue that <clears throat> is run into often is that front page content is configured in code. If a team uses an automated approach to creating content, when the configuration is exported again, the path of front page might change and commit it to code. If this was to be imported on a remote environment, Whatever random piece of content had that node ID would now be the home page. This is where you can use the config ignore module as shown in the first image. This will allow you to ignore importing entire configs like system.site or individual keys like system site page front. In this way, 
That configuration acts more like content and will not be updated on production when a configuration import happens. This can be a good approach if you like to allow things like email text to be deployed as config, but later allow editors to update the config without overriding their changes on the next deployment. The next module for configuration management can be very powerful, but also complicated and controversial. This is the config split module. The config split module is very handy if your configuration is different between environments. Although things like changing configuration items like API keys can be done effectively in settings.php, if you want to have entirely different modules enabled on different environments, this is definitely the go-to module. Another option is to use config exclude modules. This allows you to exclude modules from configuration export, but the downside is that these modules need to be enabled manually where you want to use them. The following recommendation that might save you the most amount of time is making your deployment as easy to run without needing to remember all the steps. This doesn't mean that setting up and documenting deployment is easy. It might take a lot of work, but when it comes time to start the update, it should be a relatively simple process. This can be made infinitely easier if you build this into an automated script that runs based on cleverly named branches or tags. An example of, of this one-click deployment can be seen on this slide. You'll note that it supports the ability to revert the deployment, which can really save you a lot of headaches. It also has a step to import the database and files from production, which is meant for a staging environment to test the deployment. I highly recommend that nightly production backups be made available to all developers. This might become a challenge if everyone does not have production access. This is why I like to push backups to a third-party solution like S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Azure Blob Storage. You can use the Backup and Migrate module to automate this process as well. There are also other considerations to think about when creating a production backup. Do you need to remove user data or hide any sort of sensitive data? Do you have data that you don't need locally that might inflate the size of backups? It's more like artifacts. The final step is to make sure that it is as simple as possible to import this database for developers locally so they can get up and running as fast as possible. It's often not sufficient to just provide a database import command. There should be an all-in-one command that fetches the latest database, if not already downloaded, starts up the local environment, imports the database, and runs Drush Deploy. From managing a code base, contributed by a team, to preparing a local environment, and finally to deploying those changes, I hope you've taken away at least one helpful tip that will make your experience working on large teams easier and more enjoyable. Thank you. I think we have 10 minutes if anybody had any questions. I, uh, with the initial tool that you built, uh, where you can validate all, yep. um, basically you can run any command. I mean, there, there's a world where you could use that to also check like the thing, right? You could use minting and things like that while you're validating, so you're also validating the SAS and the CSS. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any, any sort of validation uh, code that you have for validating SAS, you know, even with NPM packages and stuff like that, you could totally build that as, as another uh, command in your own robo file or you know create a uh, a feature request and uh, push it up to the uh, the project to get it incorporated absolutely and, and I've been you know trying to keep track of things that I've had ideas for like the whole PHP uh, code beautifier to add that in so I've, I'm always updating and, and trying to make it better and add more tools can, yeah can you share the URL for your repo yes definitely uh, you can find it at GitHub, and it's just slash Matt SQD. What is that again? GitHub.com slash Matt SQD. And then it should have the, the repo right there. And then hopefully I'll be able to share these slides uh, somewhere uh, later so you, you can get access to the, uh, the links I provided for like branch protection and such as well. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you everyone for coming.